From last month's Waking Up Book Club event with Sam Harris and Steven Pinker, I'm uploading this clip, which is part of Steven Pinker's opening. The event was a conversation with Sam Harris about Steven Pinker's new book, Enlightenment Now, and this clip starts just after Steven Pinker spoke about the Enlightenment's values and ideals while coming to a definition of progress. So, 250 years later, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? Well, if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because I have found that intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. <laughs> now, it's not that they hate the fruits of progress, mind you. Most uh, professors and columnists and critics uh, would rather have their surgery with anesthesia than without it. Uh, it's the idea of progress that rankles the chattering class. If you think that we can solve problems, I have been told, that means you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition and false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. <laughs> you are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, an allusion to the Voltaire character who declared all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, as it turned out, Pangloss was a pessimist. A true optimist believes there can be worlds that are much better than the one that we have today. But this is irrelevant because the question of whether progress has occurred is not a matter of wearing rose-colored glasses or having a sunny disposition or getting up on the right side of the bed or seeing the glass is half full. Uh, it's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I submit that is progress. Let's go to the data. Beginning with life, the uh, most precious resource of all. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth hovered around 30 years. But beginning with the, in the 19th century, with the discovery of vaccination, sanitation, later antibiotics, and other advances in public health and medicine, life ex expectancy at birth has increased to 71 years across the uh, globe, and virtually no one guesses that it's that high. Now, as with many examples of progress, uh, we find the progress has been highly uneven across the world. It was Europe that first made the escape from uh, pretty much universal early death, but uh, followed by the Americas in the 20th century, Asia has caught up, and now we're seeing sub-Saharan Africa close the gap. For most of human history, the major uh, cause of uh, shortened lifespan was child mortality. Even in a country that today we think of as the most, one of the most advanced in the world, Sweden, the rate of uh, child mortality in 1750 was 33%. That is, one out of three Swedish children did not live to see their fifth birthday. That was brought down to three-tenths of 1%, uh, namely a hundredfold reduction. The, the trajectory was then followed by American countries like Canada, Asian countries like South Korea, Latin American countries like uh, Chile, and most recently by sub-Saharan countries like Ethiopia, which has seen its rate of child mortality fall from 25% to less than 6%. Still too high, but uh, the reductions are continuing. Sustenance. Uh, it takes about 2,500 calories to feed a, uh, a, a moderately active adult male, a figure that uh, no country exceeded until the agricultural revolution in Britain in the late 18th century, advances in agronomy like crop rotation, later the invention of synthetic fertilizers, mechanization of agriculture, and selective breeding of vigorous hybrids resulted in England being able to feed itself, then the United States, France, and more recently Asian countries like uh, China and India. Here is the graph for the world as a whole. Uh, now, 
this would be a dubious form of progress if all those calories were just making fat people fatter. Uh, but in fact, they have been applied to reduce the rate of undernourishment in the world. In 1970, about 35% of the developing world suffered from undernourishment. That has been brought down to less than 15%. Once again, the progress has been uneven across the regions of the world. It was Latin America that first decimated undernourishment. Here are three regions in Asia, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is now bringing down the rate of undernourishment. The most extreme form of suffering from insufficient calories, of course, is famine one of the horsemen of the apocalypse, which could strike any country uh, and wreak devastation in a short period of time. But uh, over the last 150 years, the uh, rate of famine across the world has collapsed, and today famines take place only in the most war-torn and remote regions. Prosperity. For most of human history, there was little to no economic growth. Uh, this graph shows the gross world product from the year one to the year 2015. <laughs> and as you can see, economic growth only uh, really began in earnest with the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, with the development of uh, technology, particularly energy capture, uh, education, markets, financial institutions, and most re more recently, global trade, have resulted in an increase by a factor of 200 of the gross world product since the 18th century. Again, the progress has been uneven. It was uh, the UK and the US that first made what Angus Deaton calls the great escape from universal wretchedness. Uh, in the 20th century, South Korea, which was once a dirt poor country, has become uh, filthy rich. Uh, followed by Chile, and China and India are now starting to show exponential growth. Uh, once again, this would be an ex a dubious example of progress if all of the gains were simply going to the uh, proverbial 1%, but in fact they have been applied to reduce the rate of extreme poverty, usually defined as the bare minimum necessary to feed oneself and one's family. By that criterion, $1.90 in 2015 dollars per day, in 1820, 90% of the world met the criterion for extreme poverty. That has fallen to less than 10%, with most of the reductions taking place just in the last few decades, 75% reduction in the rate of extreme poverty just since uh, 1990. Because poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer, the rate of international inequality, which necessarily increased as with the Industrial Revolution as some countries began to get rich, leaving the others behind. Uh, but that has now turned a corner and international inequality is decreasing. Now, inequality within wealthy countries has uh, notoriously been increasing, but that does not mean that developed countries have become increasingly uh, callous toward the poor. Quite the contrary. Uh, for hundreds of years, no developed country uh, gave, uh, devoted more than 1.5% of its wealth to social transfers, that is to supporting children, the poor, the elderly, and the sick. But in the 20th century, every developed country embarked on a massive program of income redistribution so that today and, uh, the median among OECD countries uh, of redistribution is 22% of GDP. Thanks to these social transfers, uh, poverty has been declining even as inequality has been increasing. If you measure poverty by disposable income, that is after taxes and transfers, then uh, about 32% of the American population was uh, below the poverty line in 1960. That has fallen to less than uh, 7%. And if you measure poverty by consumption, what people can afford to live on, it's gone from 30% to less than 3%. Peace. For most of the history of nations, war was the natural state of international relations, and peace was a mere interlude between wars. We can see that in a graph that plots the percentage of years that the great powers of the day, the 800-pound gorillas, uh, were at each other's throats in wars. And we can see that 300 years ago, the uh, three or 400 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war. More recently, they have almost never been at war. In fact, the last great power war 
pitted the United States against China 65 years ago, and there hasn't been one since. If we zoom in on the 20th century, we see that uh, despite the fact that the rate of war has gone down, the intensity of the last two great power wars uh, was uh, horrendous. Here we see the rate of death of wars in the 20th century spilling into the 21st. And there's no hiding the two horrific spikes of bloodletting centered on the two world wars. But contrary to predictions that this was the beginning of an escalating series, predictions that many of us grew up with, that it was only a matter of time before the Soviet Union faced off against the United States in a nuclear world war, which would have dwarfed even the first two world wars, the Soviet Union went out of existence, the Cold War ended, and World War III never happened. Indeed, if we focus now on the post-war period, we see that there has been a um, unsteady but unmistakable decline in the rate of death from wars of all kinds. A uh, happy and underreported development that we owe to uh, the increasing commercial inter interdependency among nations, the growth of prosperity and democracy, the institution of peacekeeping forces by the United Nations, and international laws and norms against uh, conquest, together with a general increased valuation of human life, which makes it harder for leaders to turn uh, their entire generations of young men into, ca into cannon fodder. Freedom and rights. Despite some conspicuous backsliding in countries like Russia and Turkey and Venezuela, the overwhelming historical trend has been in the direction of democracy. This graph shows the relative uh, number of democracies versus autocracies across the world for the last uh, 215 years. And it shows that 200 years ago, the number of democracies could be counted on one hand, comprising about 1% of the world's population. Today, about two-thirds of the world's countries, embracing two-thirds of the world's people, are uh, democratic. Uh, in as recently as the 1970s, the world had only 31 democracies, half of Europe, was behind the Iron Curtain and ruled by totalitarian communist governments. Spain and Portugal were fascist dictatorships. Greece was under the control of a military junta, as was almost all of Latin America, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, all of which are democratic today. Violent crime. In pretty much any part of the world that lives in a state of anarchy, there are high rates of interpersonal violence. In Europe, homicide data go back to the Middle Ages, and in 1300, Western Europe had a homicide rate of about 35 per 100,000 per year. With the consolidation of centralized states and kingdoms across the medieval patchwork of uh, baronies and fiefs, the Netherlands and England brought their homicide rate down by a factor of 35 to one per 100,000 per year. Italy, later on, did the same. Uh, this is a sequence that is repeated whenever a uh, government brings frontier regions under control and the uh, code of vendetta, which naturally develops in, uh, under a state of anarchy, is replaced by the rule of law and uh, police and court system. It happened in um, colonial New England. It happened in the American Wild West when the sheriffs came to town. And even parts of the world today that are notorious for their high rates of violence, such as Mexico, has, have actually brought the rate down by a factor of about five from about a century ago. If we zoom in now on the last 50 years or so, we see that there was a reversal of this trend in the United States and in other countries when, in, starting in the 1960s, the homicide rate went through the roof. But the United States has managed uh, since then to bring its homicide rate down by more than uh, half, starting in the 1990s. With this, as with many measures of human flourishing, by the way, the United States is something of an outlier compared to its uh, Western democratic wealthy peers. Uh, but even in the United States, there's been a great progress in, in uh, reducing one of our great shames, namely high rates of interpersonal violence. The world as a whole has managed to bring its homicide rate down by 30% in the last 20 years, and there is a plausible roadmap to reducing the global homicide rate by another 50% in the next 30 years. 
It's not just homicide that has been in decline, but domestic violence, which is violence against wives and girlfriends, and the rate of rape and sexual assault, which has fallen by about 75% since data were first recorded in the 1970s. And children have become safer. The rate of victimization of kids at school, such as bullying, has come down, as has the rate of physical and sexual abuse by caregivers. In fact, we've become safer in just about every way. Uh, thanks to the development of safety technologies like airbags and uh, seat belts, the construction of better highways, better enforcement of traffic laws, your chance of being killed in a car accident has come down by 96% in the last century. We are 88% less likely to be mowed down on the sidewalk, 99% less likely to die in a plane crash, 59% less likely to fall to our deaths, 90% less likely to drown, 92% less likely to die by fire, fire departments are putting themselves out of business, 92% less likely to be asphyxiated, uh, but there is one notable exception to the trend of increased safety, and it comes from the category of poison by solid or liquid. And here you are seeing the uh, American opioid epidemic, uh, a, a tragic counterexample to increased safety. At the same time, we are 95% less likely to be killed on the job. In fact, we're even less likely to die from an act of God. The proverbial droughts, uh, floods, wildfires, storms, volcanoes, landslides, meteor strikes, earthquakes have come down by about 96% since their peak, presumably not because um, God has become less angry, but because of more resilient infrastructure, better early warning systems, and better responses to emergencies in uh, developed countries. Well, what about the quintessential act of God? Everyone's favorite metaphor for an unpredictable date with death, the literal bolt from the blue. <laughs> yes, we are 97% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Knowledge. For most of human history, in most parts of the world, everyone was illiterate. Even in early modern Europe, no more than 15% of the population could read or write. Western Europe achieved universal literacy in the 20th century. You see Germany, uh, Italy a bit later, United States, and more recently, uh, Latin American countries like Chile and Mexico. In fact, the literacy rate for the world has uh, climbed above 80%, and among people under the age of 25 to 90%, and increasingly uh, girls as well as boys. The world is almost at gender parity for literacy. And in perhaps the most astonishing, incredible, unbelievable, belief-defying example of progress of all, we have been getting smarter, believe it or not. In a well-documented phenomenon called the Flynn Effect, IQ scores have increased by three points a decade uh, throughout the 20th century. We are 30 IQ points smarter than our ancestors. This is a gift of primarily of the spread of education, but also of the trickle down of technical and abstract concepts and symbols from domains of expertise like science and technology into everyday life. Well, have any of these kinds of progress actually improved the quality of our lives? And the answer is that yes, they have. For example, the number of hours that we spend keeping ourselves alive in work has uh, decreased from 62 hours a week to uh, fewer than 40 hours a week. In addition, um, uh, most Americans get three weeks of paid vacation. Thanks to the penetration uh, of running water and electricity into 100% of households and the widespread adoption of what used to be called labor-saving devices like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves, and microwaves, the amount of time that we lose to housework, which people identify as the least favorite way of spending their time, has fallen from uh, 60 hours a week uh, down to 15 hours a week. That is from eight hours a day to two hours a day. And when I say we, I really should say women because housework is uh, highly gendered. Thanks to the 
uh, shortening of the work week and the reduction in the hours that we lose to housework. The amount of leisure time in, in the United States has increased by eight hours a week just since the 1960s. The uh, increase in leisure time leveled off for women starting in the 1990s, and that is primarily because women today spend more time with their children. In fact, a single working woman today spends more time with her children than a married stay-at-home mom did in the 1950s. So forget your stereotypes about uh, leave it to beaver and father knows best. We waste less of our paycheck on necessities from 60% a century ago to less than 33% today. Well, does any of this make us any happier? Uh, there's a saying that money can't buy happiness, but that isn't exactly true. There's a strong relationship between life, rated life satisfaction and GDP per capita. This is on a logarithmic scale, so most of the advances come in the escape from poverty and they start to level off in, for wealthier countries. And this scatter plot of points shows that within countries, uh, wealthier people are happier, wealthier countries are happier, and uh, this predicts that as countries get wealthier, their people should be happier. And indeed, in 86% of countries for which we have data, happiness has increased over the last 40 years. Uh, it, by the way, the United States is not one of them, and the United States has had a, a happiness stagnation over the last uh, 70 years. Well, I hope to have convinced you that human progress is a real thing. It is an empirical fact. And how is the fact of human progress reflected in the news? Well, I'm going to show you a graph uh, that applies a technique of sentiment mapping, namely tabulating the number of positive and negative words in news articles over the last few decades. And over all of this time in which peace and safety and education and uh, happiness um, and prosperity have increased, the New York Times has gotten more and more morose, and this is also true of a summary of the world's broadcasts. So why do people deny progress? Part of the answer comes from a feature of our cognitive psychology that Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman called the availability heuristic. Namely, people estimate risk according to how easily they can recall examples from memory. Now, combine that with the nature of the news. News is about stuff that happens, not stuff that doesn't happen. You never see a journalist saying, here I am reporting live from a country that has been at peace for 40 years, or a city that has not been attacked by terrorists. It's also, uh, news is also about sudden events, uh, not gradual changes, and a lot can go wrong very suddenly, but um, good things aren't built in a day. Uh, the economist Max Roser has pointed out that the papers could have run the headline, 138,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, every day for the last 25 years. But they never ran that headline. Uh, the Onion uh, once ran a satirical story called CNN Holds Morning Meeting to Decide What Viewers Should Panic About for the Rest of the Day. <laughs> kicking around ideas ranging from an uptick in child kidnappings to a new link between laptops and cancer, senior CNN staffers held their regular daily meeting this morning. Well, if you combine the availability heuristic with the nature of news, you can easily come away with the impression that the world is getting more dangerous and always has been. There's another feature of our psychology that militates against an appreciation of, of progress called the negativity bias, uh, summarized by the slogan, bad is stronger than good. We think about and feel bad events more than good ones. We dread losses more than we anticipate or appreciate gains. Uh, and this is especially true of uh, recent uh, losses and bad events. With the passage of time, the awfulness of memories tends to fade, explaining an observation by Franklin Pierce Adams that nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. Also, this opens up a market for prophets and doomsayers to remind us of uh, hazards that we may have overlooked. And as uh, Morgan Housel pointed out, pessimists sound like they're trying to help you. Optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a comment and hit that like button. If you didn't like it, please explain why. Open discussion is the only way to have a better understanding of differing views. Sharing this video on social media can help keep conversations alive. 
Now here are a few other videos that you may be interested in.